I was willing to be a fake Muslim just to live inside that system. And we had our English lesson there. Everyone had to write their all day hero on a piece of paper. And lucky me, the teacher pulled out Jesus. The class started laughing. <laughs> the next stage, I became atheist. How did that happen? I was very much against feminism. You women, you're all stupid. That's what you used to say. Yeah, I used to say that to them. There is some equivalence that the Prophet ﷺ mentioned between the modern way of describing the internal workings of our mind or from the perspective of Sigmund Freud, the father of modern psychology. He dedicated his entire life on this subject. He did not have 10,000, he had maybe 20,000, 30,000 patients in his lifetime. They made mistakes, they corrected, and they were dedicated on no other topic than this. And they came up with this description of our inner workings. And Rasulullah did not study psychology. He did not have patience. He did not dedicate his whole time. And he didn't correct. He said it one time and it was right. You think you're so intelligent, but if you're wrong with that point on God, then you will be the most stupidest person on your muqim. Assalamu alaikum, brother Abdul Malik. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullah. Who is Abdul Malik? Who is Abdul Malik? Abdul Malik is a German guy, and I was born in Heidelberg and grew up there in a smaller village around it, and then moved to Munich around my 20th year and lived there for a couple of years before ending up in Kuwait, alhamdulillah. So tell me about your childhood and your lifestyle. I had a very nice childhood without TV, <laughs> without computer games. I lived in a smaller village right next to the forest. So it was a weekly program to have multi hours of walk in the forest. Me and my small brother and my mom on the weekends with my dad. So how was faith in regards to your life at that time? Pretty much everyone in my generation was atheist, but we were a small group of Baptists in that area and coming from a dedicated family because that is not something usual. So for example, in my whole class level, we were like 140 students in that level. There were two or three more from dedicated Christians and none of them was proactive as I was and we had our English lesson there. The topic of the session was an all-day hero. So under the term all-day hero, everyone had to write their all-day hero on a piece of paper and put it in like a small box and then the teacher would choose one and read it out. And lucky me the teacher pulled out Jesus. <laughs> the class basically started laughing <laughs> and I stood up yeah, and you all are fools and you don't know what you're doing. <laughs> it's, like, it's like, yeah, I was dedicated. Where did this dedication came from? Since elementary school, the others, they went out into the big break and started playing football and stuff. I would stand alone in the play yard and I had a routine praying. The thing there is now reflecting back, like I said, I did not pray to anyone except my creator. I prayed to my creator and, and there was like this deep connection. I needed that. I wanted that and I needed that. The next part of my way to Islam is actually that I became atheist, which is, how did that happen? <laughs> so what happens is... Uh... Assalamu alaikum. Have you heard of the double effect? If we have 1000 viewers for this video and every single person shared that video to someone, 2000 will become four, eight, 16, 32, 64, 256, 512, 1 million view. Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said in Musnad Ahmad, Adal al khair kafa'ilih. The one who directs you to the good action is the same as the one who does the action itself. So subscribe to the channel and click the bell icon and make sure you share this video. Now let's go back to watching the video. So what happens is um, in that group of Baptists around the age of 14 and I, I went into these lessons and they are focusing a lot on Jesus. Basically their message is you don't pray to anyone except for Jesus, not your creator. I mean they would not say it in these words of course because in the end they say both is the same and I started praying to Jesus and this feeling vanished. It, it was just vanished into nothing. Really I was dedicated part of the group and within maybe two weeks, it was gone and I never visited them again. I was just out of it. It came in a time where puberty started and uh, social pressure for my weird views <laughs> grew in the friend cycle, you know. 
they became active with girls. Internet was there and they played computer games that my parents would not have approved of. And I cannot say that I lost my faith in God. I became basically agnostic, but I did not go back to worshiping my creator. I just, let's try the other stuff. One big point was alcohol. In Germany, alcohol is, uh, you can drink beer starting from 16. Part of and the culture. Oh, part of the culture, man. It's the culture. <laughs> Unfortunately, yeah. I'm coming from a small village and there is the choking about that, Danny. The small villages, all they do is drink. And really, all they do is drink. <laughs> yeah, we teenage, especially the young men, they have this habit of showing their strength by who can consume more. Also because you're still too afraid to approach women as an adult. So you just drink and hope for finding the courage to do so. For me personally, when, when you talk about where I was as in connection with God and what I felt there, the alcohol opened up things to say that I would not have the courage before to say. I needed around two years until I would openly feel uh, safe enough in my own illusion to openly say that I'm an atheist and feeling the hypocrisy and the intoxicating feeling of making yourself something that you are not, really that you are not. And that made well, you an atheist? Yeah, that really made me an atheist and a proud atheist. So t tell me about your life. And like before, sorry to interrupt, but like before, I was again outgoing with it. I, I stood up for it, you know, I, oh. and I would start arguing with Christians to put them down in their belief, to, to like, how stupid they are to believe that. What were your views about Islam at that stage in your life? Well, I didn't have much information, to be honest, although I was actively proclaiming that uh, the hijab is just a political sign. Like, I banned them all from <laughs> wearing hijab. And I mean, I was not, not um, per se against Islam. I had very little understanding for, the, for what are actually the religious rules and I just applied my own thinking on it. So how did you hear about Islam? I had a very good Turkish friend who was with me in high school. His name is Burak, in case you're watching. <laughs> um, so the Nazis pronounce a rally and I went there with a couple of friends to stand against the Nazis. On the way back in the train, there are a couple of youngsters from the Turkish who yani, tried to get into beef with us. For whom did I stand up against the Nazis? They wouldn't attack me, they would attack you guys. Why do I stand? against them, potentially being beaten up by them, then I, on the way home, potentially getting beaten up by you. you know? <laughs> That's not how it, how it should work. So I had this question, okay, where are these problems coming from, right? And um, actually, uh, Burak pointed out some hadith, some sayings from the Prophet وسلم, about how to deal with people, how to deal with the neighbors, etc. And like I said, what I did know about Islam was they have a book, right? Quran, same like Bible, same like Torah, okay. But I never heard about a hadith, the actual saying, the actual saying of the Prophet وسلم, accurately transmitted throughout the, the millennia. So that is that was something very new for me. I, I haven't heard about that before. And there is nothing like that in Christianity. And I started researching and I found an, a translation of Riyadh al-Salihin in German language. And it gave me some concept of life that piqued my interest in this specific time frame. I was interested in social studies and how society is constructed. And I held certain very conservative views, although I was atheist at that time. Uh, for example, I was very much against feminism. Well, I was very happy to reap the benefits of feminism for me as a man. And I would say, you're all are stupid. You women, you're all stupid. That's what you used to say. Yeah, I used to say that. And I used to say that to them. And I was like, okay, you want this? I will not hold open the door. And I go, you want it this way? Fine. You in the end will be crying alone. This, it's not us men. I, I really had a disgust feeling towards that whole topic. How, how family is like dissolving in the West. Yeah. The collective yeah. way of society. Yeah, the collective way of society, yeah. My dream always, my, my, my ideal life always was to marry and to stay married without divorce, like I saw from my parents. It's the most beautiful way, subhanAllah, to have uh, such a deep connection with your spouse, the full and full complete trust, knowing someone inside out, like you know no, no one else. So I saw that from my parents and I wanted that. But with 19, 20 years, like right when I finished high school, I had the full confidence in saying, I will never marry anyone 
because there is no one to marry. It's all broken generation. Nobody will hold my view on relationship. There is nobody worth marrying. But when I read Riyadh al-Salihin, the religion of Allah constructs a society that I would be very happy to join. I was willing to be Muslim, a fake Muslim, just to live inside that system. I saw that system as the most healthiest system. Traditional. I didn't find anything better than this. So I will live with this, right? Even if I'm not believing in God. And it gave you the answers in, in terms of uh, gender equality and things like that. Honestly, I reached the point where I said, okay, I will be Muslim to marry a Muslim. <laughs> Without believing in God. And that was before I actually found God again. But like, I will just be Muslim, be Muslim, to be able to marry a Muslim. Because this is the type of woman that I want. What, why is that? What, what, what values do a Muslim woman carries that attracted you? Before Islam, you were perceiving the woman as quote-unquote, sorry to say, stupid. Yeah. And then what attracted you more about Islam? Or it's, not, it's not that I feel the individual as stupid, just to, to clarify that, but the, the concept that the West is constructing there, the group of people who is the most vulnerable, is children, and then women, emotionally. It's just the case. Within feminism and the, the feministic ruled world, now you have a lot of men who are made weak, right? That's true. But the group of people who are the most unhappy is women. It is, it's like that. And there are studies about this. I would say, Abdul Malik, it's safe to say that the preservation of the unbroken chain of narrations to the Prophet ﷺ, alongside with the Islamic perspective on perceiving gender differences and the values of a, of, of a woman versus the values of, a, of, of the man and uh, the relationship between them, those are the things that started to attract you into Islam. Well, um, I can... Uh more examples on, on how ahadith were the key point that brought me to, to Islam. SubhanAllah, after I became Muslim, it was like half a year after I have already been Muslim that I first touched the Quran and read it. Like, except for what I needed for prayer, obviously, but then really going into Quran took me a while. I was so stuck into, and it's not, not bad to be stuck there, but you know, I was so focused on ahadith, SubhanAllah. Uh, some things on the way to becoming Muslim where yeah, the, the, the entry point was definitely this whole construction about society. And there was more than just the point of how family works and the, the role of the wife, the role of the husband. There was more. Also how, how uh, kids are fueled. Yeah, and it's not a very child-friendly environment in, in the West. The next step was I was, uh, there is some hadith that led me back to psychology. There is some equivalence that the Prophet ﷺ mentioned between the modern way of describing the, the internal workings of our mind, of our personality, from the perspective of Sigmund Freud, the father of modern psychology. In Islam, there is the aql, the nafs, the qalb, and the ruh. You have these different instances. And in modern psychology, from Sigmund Freud's perspective, you have different internal instances as well. The it, the over I, the I, and you can relate them to what Rasulullah SAW said, pretty much one to one, okay? You have the nafs, it's the instance that just provides motivational energy to pursue the core urges, right? So the, the unfiltered core urges before anything is filtered out. Then you have the next instance, for example, the qalb, who is like the moral instance, which in a uh, psychological term from Sigmund Freud is the over eye, which is constructed, interestingly, from your social surroundings, according to, to Sigmund Freud, which is exactly the same as in Islam, because the qalb is, yani, we don't say it's constructed, but its moral views can be changed, like the over eye that Sigmund Freud describes. And it's the moral instance the urge from the it, from the nafs, comes and is then monitored by the moral instance, saying, oh, that is not a good urge. You should not do that, right? Something feels right or wrong based on the status of your qalb, of your heart, or the over eye in Sigmund Freud's terms. 
it's, it's the same system and I can go into more details, but I will cut it short here. The thing that at that point, Yanni caught my attention is that Sigmund Freud was a scholar who dedicated his entire life on this subject. He did not have 10,000, he had maybe 20,000, 30,000 patients in his lifetime that he studied on. And he dedicated his whole time on that. And he wrote books and he made mistakes. And he revised his views and wrote stuff again. And he discussed with other scholars of that time you know, that was a high time of modern psychology. I mentioned Alfred Adler that my parents follow. He was in the same time. And his views, Sigmund Freud's views, were corrected from his daughter. She followed up after him. And later on, her views were corrected. And like the modern psychology is still based on his views, but it went through corrections. SubhanAllah, and things changed and, you know. But the core thing is they made mistakes, they corrected, and they were dedicated on no other topic than this. And they came up with this description of our inner workings. That, fit, that fits 100% with the hadith. Well, a good part of it. There are differences when you go into the details, but the broader picture is correct. And Rasulullah did not study psychology. He did not have patience. He did not dedicate his whole time. Right? And he didn't correct. He said it one time and it was right. That was one of the strong strikes against my overinflated ego. Well, okay, one moment, one moment. You think you're so intelligent, but if you're wrong with that point on God, then you will be the most stupidest person on your muqim. That's like started the thought on you better check that point again. Wow. Tunnel. After that stage where I started thinking again about God and like questioning my atheism, I went back to the start, to Christianity. I was still living with my parents. I started discussing with them about religion. And in these discussions, I took the point of view as a Muslim. And that is how they became aware that I'm thinking about that direction and I directly got some feedback especially from my mom I love my mom she's a little bit energetic and her direct feedback was if you become Muslim you're not my son you will go out <laughs> but I know my mom and uh, it did not move me much and I, I know that this is just words uh, I have great, great relationship until now, alhamdulillah. alhamdulillah. But I, I discussed a lot with my father. He, he quoted something from the Bible and the meaning of the one who knocks the door, the door will be opened for him. If you really, really come to God asking for him, he will reveal himself. He, he will show you the way. And um, I thought, okay, I will make a test. I will pray one time to Jesus and ask him for guidance. And then I will one time ask for, you know, ask my creator for, for guidance and I'll see what happens. And I was about to do that. And then I stopped. And the realization came, if there is God, and I don't know the exact way, then the only thing I can do is only ask God. Because any step further would be maybe the fatal mistake of worshiping again someone else. But if I only ask God, only God will answer. And this is the, the core thing between Islam and Christianity. And one of the core um, discussion points that I had with my parents, on the day of judgment, I, as a Muslim, will come forth in front of God and I have not worshiped anyone beside him. You are taking the gamble to worship something additional that with your words, you are forming, ah, it's still the same, etc. You are in the danger, not me. I'm safe. You think God will punish me for not worshipping anyone else than him? I will come clean from any worship aside, uh, besides him. I will have only worshipped him. You have the extra step that you will need to be sure if it's right or not. So I went into the bathroom, took my first wudu and I prayed to Raqqa. If there is a moment where I would say, yeah, that was when you had really converted to Islam, it would have been that. That moment. So how did it feel when you did the Torah prayer? I'm stubborn. 
I'm stubborn. It uh, still was not that I fully accepted everything. It felt right. Definitely felt right. And it was not the last two raka that day. But I still had trouble with some issues. For example, the status of my parents on the Day of Judgment. Because I feel them as very, very good people. They freely give from their money for the poor and they are not harmful to anyone, etc. I, I could not understand how, how would their status be. That point taught me like the absolute core basis of Tawhid. Because they're not good with God. Subhanallah. It doesn't matter what you do. Subhanallah. If you want one-on-one -on -one connection, how you treat your creator is wrong. It doesn't matter what else you do. Allah And may Allah guide your, your parents. Um, a couple of days later, I was alone at, at home, the doorbell rang, and I opened and it was a missionary. He approached me, I would like to talk about Jesus with you. I'm not interested. I'm Muslim. But you're German, right? You're, you're German? Yeah, I'm German. I'm a new Muslim. Have a nice day. I closed the door. And then I stood there for a second and like, okay. Yeah, actually I'm a Muslim. How did you take your Shahada? By myself. In my, in my room. SubhanAllah. I was starting to listen a lot to lectures from Daya, uh, who were active at that time in Germany. You took Shahada online? Yeah, but you can say so. I mean, I learned about the, the Aqidah, I learned about Tawheed. At some point I took the Shahada. What are the challenges that you faced after accepting Islam? In, in my direct surroundings, there were a couple of people who were um, pretty openly against Islam. I had some connections to someone who was going into the Nazi direction. I had, on the other side, friends, an orth uh, Orthodox Christian uh, Egyptian who was not very well uh, towards towards Islam as a topic. Although in the same group there was this Turkish guy, but like religion was off the table, we just didn't discuss it. I started praying in, in high school, but I went out of the building into a, like a small forest, prayed there. Uh, off the small walkway, I went in between the trees. Um, yeah, and also within my family, I didn't proclaim it first. My mom got the right hunch. <laughs> Why the bathroom is always wet? You go there, you're two minutes in and the whole sink is wet. Are you washing for prayer? <laughs> and she stopped cooking pork. So like I said before, yeah. you're not my son, you're out if you're Muslim. But on only words, she, she actually she, stopped cooking. She started supporting your decision or Respecting it. Respect. Uh, she knows me very well. She knows that I'm not doing 50%. So she could have cooked pork as much as she wants. She knew I would not eat it. So she stopped cooking it. How was life after Islam? After accepting Islam compared yeah. to uh, atheism and compared to your life before that and the party and having fun? As much as in teenage years, there was a pull towards that. As much you feel emptiness when you have it. It's not fulfilling. It's a constant chase of something that in the end you don't have. For example, when you drink alcohol, you have a rush of endomorphins the first time you drink it. Already the second time is not even 50% of that. And the third time you're not feeling any endomorphins, no matter how much alcohol you drink after that. Like honestly, it, 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 it got disgusting. I, I was disgusted by myself at some point. We have this, uh, specifically in this group of friends or in this surrounding, in this village, we are known for the amount of alcohol we drink. And it's like you, you, you meet up to drink. That's the topic of the evening. Like, where do we go to drink? And then what? Sometimes it's just you drink until in the next morning you don't remember what you did. That's fun. That's fulfilling. It's just stupid. It's really just animalistically stupid. There, there's, there's no benefit for you. There's no real fun. It's, it's not fun. You always had the emptiness. Yeah, there is a certain emptiness, yeah. Then, that you continuously chase to, to fight. You know, you continuously chase to avoid the emptiness or find something that would fill it up uh, with the next party, with the next... It's not that you don't have fun at all. 
course there are points that you have fun with, but overall, that's something that I realized after I became Muslim and then years later, yani catching up on some friends and noticing that they're basically the same like they have been in the late teens. They're like 25, 26, 27. I'm married, I have multiple kids. They're still going to party acting like 18 year old. You know what I mean? It's not fulfilling. The emptiness you had, how did Islam assisted that emptiness after accepting Islam? Well, there was none. <laughs> what can I say? There, there is none. You have a purpose in life. For me, it was like coming home, basically. As a child, in second grade, third grade, I started reading the Bible. Until I was in fifth or sixth grade, I had read it multiple times. For me, it was like coming home. I always loved the old testimony more than the new one. It's also something strange maybe for, but uh, specifically some chapters about uh, Abraham and his multiple wives and like I, this, this picture of this old man with his beard and a clan of family, family and holding together in, in the surrounding as well, being dependent on one another. And, and this, just this picture, uh, caught me and the going back to Islam was really going back home where I came from, from the feeling. And yeah, so there was not much of emptiness. I, I enjoyed the ibadah. I went fully into it. I was lucky that, you know, Alhamdulillah, Allah made it this way. I converted right at the end of my high school. So I had a lot of free time for a couple of months. And subhanAllah, actually, I was quick and merry, Alhamdulillah, uh, just three or four months after I finished my high school, I married. Alhamdulillah. So my life was not boring. <laughs> I had enough to do then. Alhamdulillah. So what are some advices you would give to non-Muslims? There's a couple of things that I would say from my own experience. Number one, don't wait for a magic moment for an angel coming down and proclaiming you should be Muslim now. Stick to what you have seen, understood as truth and don't let it go. What is clearly an undisputed truth, there is one God and he created everything. Don't let go of that. And if you come to a topic that you don't understand, don't be shy to leave that topic without leaving what you have already found as truth. Because you will hit some topics that are controversial, that you don't fully understand, where there's maybe a lack of information or a lack of perspective, it will come and you can ask God for that. The second point, never be shy and never be slow in asking God for continuous guidance. He did yeah. Salat al-Mustaqim yeah. every day, 17 times. Yes, correct, Allah Akbar. Yeah, and you should feel this question. It should not be empty words. In the end, if you really want to come to God, leave the decision what is right for God. It's not your decision. It's His decision. You want to serve Him? He will lead you there if you really want to serve him. Raise your hands and ask him for guidance. Raise your hands and ask him for the correct way. If you really feel that, without any preconditions what you would like to have, your only condition is to be with him, he will lead you, definitely. And the last point, the point about science and the consensus of society. In the last like century, big thinkers in the West continuously push this point, you know, that we don't need a God. And there is like an, an overall feeling of, of stupidity if you really cling on to that, that thought. It's not the natural viewpoint that there is a God and please explain why there is not. It's now flipped, right? If you really hold the view that there is a God, then please explain something might not be right, <laughs> you know? The other thing is, of course, that we are in an age of information. There is a lot of information for everyone. A not well-defined belief cannot hold itself against science and, you know. The problem is that Christianity does not offer much in that regard. So did science play a big role in terms of moving people away from Christianity? You, you have this very, I mean, this is basically the, the viewpoint or the, the, the point for any Christian now in the West that they have to combine the scientific census, uh, consensus with their belief, right? For them, they, they need to figure out a way to do that. You know, Islam 
has answers for you there. You don't need to try to construct anything. For the basic Christian in the West, there is this challenge to say, yeah, I accept everything that the scientists say and I will make it fit somehow. The other thing is that uh, Christianity has a lack of clear defined points of belief, what you're actually believing in. You see when you're discussing about Christianity and you go into the deep discussions, most of them are lost in words that have no meaning, that, that are not transporting a real concept. He is three, but one, but one, but three. And you cannot separate him, but you should separate him. You know what I mean? And it's they, words. And they say it's a mystery. Yeah, it's, it's words. And the backup from whatever does not make sense is you just have to believe it. And you will feel the belief, <laughs> you know, it, it becomes emotional rather than, and it just accept it. So, so you feel, will feel it's right. But the, the, this is the problem. Uh, you have that in contrast, I mean, in, in ages before where there is not this strong consensus in science and the strong spread of certain um, logical patterns, how to analyze, how to... Now we are, we are taught this way in school. We are taught to critically think. So the natural thing to do when you are coming from a religious background is you start dissecting your, the things that were taught in, in religious context. And you go there with the scientific methods you have learned. If there is no substance, logical and structural and uh, substance in what you have yani, as your belief, it will turn to hold up. Then you are, in the end, you are just saying, I, uh, I just have to believe. I still want to believe, so I just believe. So, so there's a need of belief, so they just fill it up with the, the closest answer they have to to them. Um, uh, yeah, when you, when you say that most of them are atheists, then, I mean, if you go deep into it, but most people don't, uh, you know, and most people, they don't go deep into what they should believe. They go through their daily lives, and science is not only the consens, but whenever they look into it, it makes sense. So that's the answer for them. But if you go deep into it, then of course you will reach a level of analysis in science where any scientist of that specific field will say, until here, if you want to go deeper, we have to research more. We did not see the answers until now, right? So there is a bottom line of where, where they reach and they, well, they would say we have not yet reached further, but in the end, that is also, in the end, a belief. The closer you look to the creation, you will find God in the detail. You will see that there cannot be any other way than that God has created everything. There is no contradiction in what science finds and there being a God, if you look close enough. All the big scientists in basically every field, from biology to physics to psychology, you always find these two groups. The one saying there is no God and we have not discovered the full truth, but we will keep looking. And the other group, there is a God and we are only discovering what he has created. These are the two groups. There is no scientist in any field who says we have found the truth and there is no God. There is none because in no field they have reached there. There is none like that. In whatever field you go, the maximum they can say and they are saying is we need to search more. We need to discover more. We will find yet another layer of depth that will explain the layer before it. So don't be afraid from claims from someone who thinks he knows science that there is no God. Look into this topic and you will discover God in the very detail. Thank you, Brother Abdul Malik. And Jazakallah khair for it. Well, yeah, I was happy and my, my pleasure to be here. Alhamdulillah and to share my story and the hopes that would help people that are on the way, inshallah ta'ala, to be our brothers and sisters. <laughs>